Good evening and welcome again to uh, Robinson Baptist Church online. And uh, we are going to begin by singing a couple hymns and reading out of God's Word, but we'll start by singing Wonderful Words of Life. Wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life, offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, so If you'll open your Bibles, we'll turn to the book of Matthew and reading out of chapter 20, reading the first 28 verses of Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire, hire laborers for his vineyard. When he agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And, when, and he went about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go but I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first, and the first last. As Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves. And on the way he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock 
and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day he will be raised up. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, My cup you shall drink. But to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but as it is for those to whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. We'll continue in song by singing, Be Still My Soul. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you very much, Brother Theo. It is a wonderful thing to be with you again this evening, and thank you for joining with us wherever you are. 
So open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We will uh, be uh, working on our text today. We are continuing the second part of uh, chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes. So let's say a word of prayer, and then we will be on our way in our study. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your graciousness. Thank you for the testimony of Solomon and the wisdom you gave him. And thank you for the word of God that, that is to us today, that we may understand how life is supposed to be lived under the sun. That means in this earth, on this earth. We pray for our people as we worship you in this Palm Sunday. We pray that the, the eyes would be fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that the principles of truth will be evident in their lives, vivid to their eyes, and that their hearts will search you. We pray, Father, that you will be above all things, as you have not determined that anybody, anything on this earth, will give lasting satisfaction to human beings. But it is in you that we find lasting satisfaction. And it will be clear, we hope, as we ask you to assist in the scripture that we are going to uh, expound before our people today. May it be so to your honor and glory and the edification of the saints. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you. So we are in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And uh, we are going to see, to study today, if you, verses uh, 12 to 23. If you remember last Sunday, we studied verses 1 to uh, 11. So, in this uh, COVID-19 uh, time, laboratories around the world are feverishly working to develop vaccine against it. So, they are also working on various types of tests to help detect the infection fast. Detect it fast, cheaply, and individually so that you might not have to go to hospitals. You could test yourself. So the test, the test themselves are tested to ensure their accuracy and validity. As one health professional said, Dr. Elizabeth Bix, I uh, remember, said, we want to make sure to avoid false positives or even worse, false negatives. So we have in our passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 a similar situation. The predicate to the book of Ecclesiastes is a general, uh, general, e, general is a search. According to the second part of verse 3, chapter 2, Solomon is trying to search to see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. So if you were to find something that has ultimate value and lasting satisfaction, then we can prescribe it to all men to say, hey, this is what you need to do all the days of your life because this is the thing that gives satisfaction. So Koheleth, or the preacher, or the lecturer, or the assembler, or Solomon, as you may use all those different terms to identify him or call him. So he was in search of what was of lasting value. What was a gain profit in whatever is done under the sun or in this world? So I found, it would be, uh, if, if, if found, it will therefore be prescribed to all human beings. So to ensure no false positive in regard to what is of lasting value or no false negative, Solomon tests himself. So the tester is being tested. So the self-testing is chapter 2. Almost all the verses in chapter 2 either begin or contain the personal pronoun I or its possessive and, uh, and objective uh, equivalent. So as I explained last week, 
the chapter develops uh, the same themes as the rest of the book. Investigation, verses 1 to 11, and evaluation, verses 13 to 23 of chapter, uh, uh, to verses 12 to 23 of chapter 2, and a conclusion, verses 24 to 26. So Solomon used the test on himself first before testing the rest of the world. So as you see, just as you have those three major sections in uh, chapter 2, that's what you have in the rest of the book. He is not simply providing anecdotal evidence. He actually conducts a scientific investigation of his hypothesis upon himself. So, as to expect, he provides a section on investigation of his labor, and that is the same section you have in chapter chapters 3 to 6 in the book. And he provides a section on evaluation of his wisdom. That is the same section you have in chapters 7 to 11. And then he provides a conclusion in verses 24 to 26, which will be the same type of thing that you will see in chapters um, uh, 12, in chapter 12. So the same thing. Then, as we have a sin, we had one general introduction. We had two partial introduction, uh, introductions. We have in chapter 2, the testimony of Solomon. And we have the investigation, the uh, chapters 3 to 6. We have uh, the evaluation, chapter 7 to 11, and two partial conclusions and one general conclusion. So last week, we studied chapters 2 to chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. So we labeled that chap that those 11 verses, investigation of life, that is Solomon's life, and it is the futility of labors, the futility of endeavors. So in those 11 verses, Kohelev conducts the investigation in three spheres. Pleasure, verses 1 and 2, folly, verses verse 3, and achievement, verses 4 to 11. And toward the end, in verses 9 and 10, we notice three points of qualification for the experiment that Solomon conducted. And those three things are this. One, the data for the experiment, experiment were all inclusive. Solomon did not keep his eyes, he said, from anything, nor withhold his hands from anything. So he included everything in the investigation, according to verse 10. So the second thing we also notice, in verse 9 he said, Also my wisdom remain with me. He was in control of the experiment all the way and never skewed it. He was wise while he was building all those buildings and he knew what he was doing. And the third thing, he said, pleasure was in the process, not in the achievement, not in the finality. That's what he says in verse 10. He said, my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward in all my labor. His reward was not the finality or the achievements. His rewards were the enjoyment of the process. So, our section of study today is the second half of Solomon's testimony. He investigated labor in chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Now in chapter 2, verses 12 to 23, he is evaluating wisdom. It is evaluation of life, Solomon's life, that shows the futility of wisdom. Hmm, wisdom, the guy who was the wisest man on earth is talking about his wisdom when he evaluated it. So Solomon evaluates how his wisdom was used. And he determined that wisdom in and of itself is as futile as work in and of itself. Neither, neither wisdom nor work provide lasting value. Neither provides a profit whereby you may say we never need to repeat it again because it would have been conclusive. 
neither work nor, nor wisdom. So today's section of study can be divided in two parts. The first in verses 12 to 16, and the second in verses 17 to 23. So in the first part, verses 12 to 16, Solomon evaluates wisdom by comparing it with folly, side by side. In the second part, verses 17 to 23, Solomon evaluates wisdom by assessing its finality to see whether it comes to something that is an achievement you don't have to repeat again. So in one, he evaluates the difference between wisdom and folly. In the second part, he evaluates the equity or the profit between wisdom and folly. What is it that is gained? Let's look at the first part. In this first part, Solomon is doing a comparative study, a comparative evaluation. Solomon begins the report on his evaluation of his wisdom life with a comparative evaluation between wisdom and folly. So let's read those verses. This is 12 to 16. He says, Then I turn myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who succeeds the king? Only what the king has already done. Then I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I myself perceive that the same event happens to them all. So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, this also is breath. For there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? The same way the fool dies. So, <laughs> he does not spare any punches, does he? He makes three points in this comparison between wisdom and folly. The comparison itself, the superiority of wisdom over folly, and the similar fate that both ultimately endure. So let's look at those three points that he makes in verses 12 to 16. In verse 12, Solomon begins with the declaration of the evaluation that he's doing. He says in verse 12, he's making a comparison between wisdom from its opposite, which is folly. A better translation of verse 12 would be, I turn myself to consider wisdom from madness and folly, rather than wisdom and madness and folly. So he is making comparison between wisdom on one side and madness and folly. So here, Koheleth, or the preacher, announces that he is changing the subject from investigating labor in verses 1 to 11 to evaluating wisdom beginning with verse 12. So he will begin the evaluation with a comparative study between wisdom and its antithesis, folly. So the point of comparison between the two will be the same as that he just concluded. If you look at the end of verse 11, he says this, there was no profit under the sun when he investigated uh, labor. So what he's going to try, whether there is any lasting profit between wisdom and folly, which one provides it? So he looks at this. He has uh, to be, if you look at it, he says in, uh, uh, you recall that uh, um, he introduced his investigation of labor with an examination of pleasure. You remember that in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2? He found pleasure, or with the analogy to pleasure, mirth. He found mirth to be madness, or better, nonsense, or delusion. Why? Because pleasure does not last. It has to be repeated over and over again. He also found, in verse 3, folly to be empty, like breath. 
It has no substance, no backbone to it. By themselves, the delusion named pleasure, nicknamed madness, both here and in verse 2, so you remember he said, I said of laughter, madness in verse 2, so he nicknamed pleasure, laughter, madness. So he says that madness and folly are like breath. They do not provide lasting profit or satisfaction. So how does wisdom fare against pleasure or nickname madness? How does pleasure, how does wisdom fare against pleasure and folly? Before answering that question, Korelev includes a parenthetical statement, the second part of verse 12. He says, for what can the man do who succeeds the king? Only what? The king has already done. So in this rhetorical question, and in the answer to it, Solomon raises the question whether anyone after he, the king, who could find anything, after he, the king, whether anyone could find anything different, a conclusion different from what uh, uh, the king himself has concluded. After all, the king had nearly unlimited wisdom and wealth. And there is not going to be anyone on earth with the being, having the power of a king, the wealth of Solomon, and being the wisest man on earth, all the qualifications to the superlative. So the king had gathered data inclusively. Remember those three things I told you in verses 9 and 10? He gathered data inclusively. The king had kept his wisdom all throughout the process. The king had found... Uh, the process rather than the finality of his labor to be enjoyable? So could anyone after him be as qualified as he was to conduct a better investigation and evaluation? No. Whoever were to try the same thing would arrive at the same conclusion to which the king had arrived long, long ago. So this seal... This seals this book of Ecclesiastes as inspired to the same extent as any other inspired scripture. God gave Solomon power, understanding, and wealth. And it is in using those gifts from God that he conducted the study. And he's saying, it's done. So the only thing that is of lasting value in all of this is not wisdom itself, it's not folly itself, it's what God makes Solomon discover to pass to us. And he's saying, you don't need to repeat it again, and if you were to go and do the same thing that I did, you will find the same results. So, what Solomon is prescribing here is as binding as any thou shalt in the Ten Commandments. It's God's word, it's scripture. So we see this first thing in verse 12. He declares the evaluation of wisdom in a comparative study. And then in verses in verse 13, all the way to the first half of verse 14, we have the second point that he's making. The comparative superiority of wisdom. He says this, then I saw that wisdom excels. And I will explain to you that word excels, what it, it, it literally means. He says, wisdom excels folly. And he says, it is as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. So in the practice of life, of course, wisdom excels over folly. The expression translated here by excel is the idea of leftover. <laughs> so when spent in the practice of life, wisdom has a little leftover. To meet the demands of life, folly does not go all the way. When you compare the two, wisdom goes a little bit further than folly. Though still wisdom does not go all the way. Folly may go to 4 out of 10. Wisdom may go to 6 out of 10. So it has a leftover of 2, for example, over, over folly. So that superiority is in the essence of the two. 
just like like light and darkness. Just as light gains over darkness when light, light shines, wisdom has a leftover over folly, just as light has a leftover over light. So we commonly refer to wisdom as enlightenment and folly as obscurity. In essence, wisdom is superior to folly in the practice of life. So the comparative advantage is also proven in the application of the two in chapter 14, the first half of chapter, uh, um, not chapter, verse 14, the first half. The wise man perceived things. That's what he means when he said the wise man has eyes in his head. The wise man weighs the possibilities. The wise man warns himself. He acts prudently. And thus, he avoids danger. He has eyes in his head. It was the philosopher Thoreau who, speaking of a disappointing incident in life, said, this incident advertises me or warns me. This incident advertises me that there is such a fact as death. You see, in his wisdom, he sees things. He can evaluate situations and draw principles of right conducts. But the fool is not as to use the word of Torah, as advertised. And the word advertised is an archaic uh, sense of the word, not it is uh, advertisement or that you do. It means to warn or notify. So the fool walks in darkness, says Solomon. He walks through life in obscurity and suddenly stumbles over obstacles. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 18 to 19 says it well. It says, but the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. You see, despite wisdom, little superiority, that little left over, or that little advantage of a folly, that smirging, <laughs> okay? It has a little smirging more than folly. Ultimately, neither one by itself provides ultimate satisfaction. God has not given to humanity the wherewithal with their own understanding, wisdom, in order to get ultimate satisfaction. Wisdom by itself has an advantage of a folly, a little smirging in the practice of life now. But the advantage is like a leftover because ultimately they end the same way. They suffer the same fate. And that's exactly in verses, uh, second half of verse 14 through verse 16, that is exactly the point that Solomon is going to, to make. Is going to make the point, wisdom and folly have the same finality. Listen to what he says. Yet I myself perceive that the same event happens to both of them, to them all, both folly and wisdom. So I said in my heart, you mean as it happens to the fool, it's also going to happen to me, the wisest man on earth? And why was I then more wise? Why then was I the wisest among people? And at this time Solomon was writing this, he had won many trophies. In fact, 1 Kings says that he was wider than all the other people who were reputed wise in the world. So he had the, he had the, the gold medal in regard to wisdom. And he says, so me with the gold medal in wisdom is going to happen to me the same way it happens to the fool? So why then did I win the gold medal? Then I said in my heart, this also is breath. For there is no more remembrance of the wise than there is remembrance of the fool forever. Since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? As the fool. It is disappointing, isn't it, to the wise man that where he thinks he had an advantage, 
there he finds that ultimately his advantage was deficient. It is, it vanishes in the big spectrum of life. Korah left the wisest man after Jesus, who had trodden the earth, will be expressing disgust throughout the rest of his report of, or uh, testimony about that very fact. He, the wisest man on earth, did not have a lasting advantage over the most foolish man on earth. That is a great breath. It is a deep, mysterious, mind-boggling thing. Death is, so to speak, the great equalizer. Both the wise and the fool die the same way. You know, heart stops beating, brain stops pulse pulsation, blood turns cold, flesh decays. When you look at a dead man in a morgue, all things being normal, there is no difference that, uh, that one morgue occupant was wise or that another morgue occupant was a fool. And after a few weeks, hmm, all hints of evidence are altogether vanished. Even worse, Solomon discovers, no one is more remembered or honored than the other. You say, mm, are you sure? Well, yeah. Obelis obelisks and monuments and memoirs uh, are attempts to make one man more remem rememberable than another. But does the dead man know that to enjoy it? Do you ever see a dead man say, you know, look at that obelisk and all those memoirs. I'm enjoying it. No. One striking example of this truth is the introduction that follows after the successful epic life of Joseph. It says in Exodus chapter 1 verse 8, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Joseph the just? was no more remembered than his brothers, the wicked. And you know, such a realization brought frustration or disgust to Kohelef. And he expressed his feelings clearly in his testimonials twice. He says in verse 17, therefore I hated life. And he says in verse 18, then I hated all my labor. So the comparative evaluation between wisdom and folly showed wisdom had a little leftover advantage, a smudging over folly, because it helps you do better choices while life is. But ultimately, they have the same finality. And that is what Solomon is going to evaluate next in verses uh, 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 17 to 23. So as we come to the second part, the first part was that comparative study. So the second part will be a finality evaluation that he's going to do. And what is the value of wisdom of a folly, folly in their finality, in their finality? So Kohelef for Solomon or the preacher he looks at this value proposition between wisdom and folly to discover what it is at death and after death. So what is the value of wisdom over folly at death, verse 17, and after death, verses 18 to 23? So let's read this. He says, therefore I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me, for all is breath and trying to grasp the wind, running after it to catch it. Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must live it, I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether that man will be wise or a fool? Yet he will rule over all my labor 
in which I toil and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. Hmm. This also is breath. Therefore I turned my heart and despaired of all the labor in which I had toiled under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is breath and a great calamity translated by evil here. For what has man for all his labor and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? For all his days are sorrowful and his work burdensome. Even in the night his heart takes no rest. Ha! Ah, this is also breath. Solomon is making two points here, one in verse 17 and one in verses 18 to 23. The first thing he's saying in verse 17 is this. Neither wisdom nor folly provides final profit at death. The frustrating reality that at death, both the wise and the fool are equalized the same, led Koheleth to conclude that life is meaninglessly distasteful as it is. The expression, therefore, I hated life, as you said in verse 17, that means I got frustrated with life for the way it is. I got disgusted with life that it has no lasting value in and by itself. Life in itself is distasteful to me. He labors grievously to gain an advantage of a folly, an advantage that will be lasting, but in the end, no advantage was visible. Both the wise and the fool return to dust. It amounts to the same. You know, all this, a breath is a breath-like uh, elusiveness to him. It is like chasing after the wind. That's why we have that expression, grasping the wind. When I'm thinking about this thing and seeing it has no end. It's like I'm running after the wind, trying to catch it with all energy and effort, and ultimately and certainly with no success in catching it. All you really get in trying to get this to work, that you will find lasting value in life as it is, it is distress, discomfort, and dissatisfaction. We believe as we know why God has not given to his creation in any part of it for human beings to fi find lasti lasting satisfaction. So he says, okay, if wisdom and f neither wisdom nor folly provides final profit at death, what about after death? So in verses 18 to 23, Koalef is evaluating life under the sun. Therefore, in speaking of after death, after the wise man is dead or after the fool is dead, he is not evaluating what the wise or the fool is doing where they are when they are dead. No. He is talking about what they left behind. He is evaluating what continues to happen under the sun Related to someone who is already dead. There he expresses again two sets of frustration. He expresses one frustration in verses 18 and 19, where he says he is frustrated with the fact that when he dies, he has no control over all the work which he had done. Remember, he's the king, he has all control when he's alive. And he's looking and I said, man, when I'm dead, I have no control over this. And I'm wise. And the second frustration that he expresses for wisdom after death is, is verses 20, 23. No control, verses 18 and 19. 
And he is frustrated with the fact that the possessions, the possession he leaves behind will most likely be squandered by a fool. So, in the end, when you go after death, even the leftover smudging advantage that wisdom had over folly, even that will ultimately be eaten up by folly itself. The first frustration is about finality of possessions, verses 8 and 19. And the second frustration is about fragility of possessions, verses 20, uh, uh, verses 20 to uh, 23. So let's look at that first frustration. Frustration number one, finality of uh, possessions. No control over possessions after death. You remember all the phenomenal labors of Solomon in uh, chapter 2, verses 3 to 10? Do you remember he amassed a wealth Estimated at about $2.1 trillion in today's estimation. You remember he made silver as valuable as rock was? It was so common. People look at silver. Oh, it's nothing. It's like rock. Do you remember he wrote the best poems, etc., and etc.? That's a fabulous set of works. And you know, after death, he will have no control of it. That was frustrating and mentally disgusting. He would have to live, he would have to live the results of all his painstaking and smart labor to his heir. And he has no clue. He had no way of knowing whether the successor would be wise and manage the estate profitably or whether he would be foolish and waste his estate disastrously. And the wise men would lose all control. And he says at the end of that verse, this is also breath. It is a breath in that it is an impenetrable and uncontrollable fact. Frustration number two, verses 20 to 23. Fragility of possession. And he gives a story hypothetically, of squandered inheritance. In verse 20, Kohelef repeats the desperate circumstance in which he, as all people do, finds himself. He says, the fruits of labor do not last. They get this dissipated. Possessions of the, or the fruits of labor are at the mercy of, of whomever is left behind under the sun. The person who works has no control and cannot change the nature of the fruits of his labor. The fruits of labor are fragile and can easily be squandered. And then in verse 21, Solomon puts forth a probability as an, illust as an illustration. He says, any person can apply himself or herself studiously with all aptitude, knowledge, and skill to acquire some fruits from their labor, and then another who knew nothing of the pain and toil inherit the fruits of these hard labors, and the wise man now dead is helpless. And most likely, the inheritor, the heir, will be a fool who will squander this marvelous inheritance. Ha. You know, Solomon's evaluation turned out to be prophetic. Sad to say, Solomon's son, Roboam, proved to be a fool, not a wise. He squandered the fruits of his father's labor. So you have it. This man goes to evaluate what is under the sun in this world that will be of lasting value, and if he found it, he could prescribe it to all humanity to say, hey, he is the one thing worth doing or knowing under the sun all the days of your life because this one has lasting value. 
He investigated work, no profit. He investigated wisdom, still he found it at the end, really, no profit even there. So you look at the man who built the most than anybody, all the pleasure, the joy was in the process, not in the finality. You look at the man who was the wisest among everybody, he evaluates that to himself, still no. You look at those last verses in verses 18 to 23, everything he's saying is a no. No grasp in verse 18, no grasp, no security. Verse 19, no certainty. Verse 20, no comfort. Verse 21, no control. Verse 22, no profit. Verse 23, no rest. And what Solomon described is the best, the best that, the best wisdom and the best works can produce. No grasp, no certainty, no comfort, no control, no profit, no rest. Just a little leftover advantage on folly. That's all. Else human beings who try to find lasting value in creation rather than enjoying the process and rather than fearing God, that's where they end up. They end up with no grasp, no security, no certainty, no comfort, no control, no profit, no rest. Solomon says again at the end of uh, verse 20, he says, <laughs> this is also breath. This means this is another aspect, another proof, another evidence of breath. God has created this universe in an inscrutable manner. Lasting value is in relationship with him. This universe is for us to enjoy while on the journey of developing a relationship of lasting value with God. The closer we are to God, the more we will enjoy all things that God has created. You know, the lesson Kohelef is passing to us is this. One, pleasure Pleasure solely in material things is never fulfilling, nor satisfying. Two, whether one is wise or foolish, the inherent truth about material things do not change. There is pleasure in labor. The pleasure is not in finality, it is the process, it is in the process. The results are neither certain nor lasting. Creation and activities within creation should instigate a thirst that is quenched only in your relationship with God. And this will be brought to light even more clearly in the conclusion that Solomon states in verses 24 to 26. And that is the conclusion that we will be studying next week. And uh, as we study this, what I'll tell you from what Solomon just expressed to us, the most accomplished and richest man on earth, the wisest man on earth, he investigated his works, he evaluated his wisdom, and said, by themselves, no lasting value. No lasting value. The only advantage you have in them is if you have them, enjoy them while they last. And build a relationship with God. So as this evening separates us, separates us from next evening, when we'll come to study the conclusion of Solomon's scientific report and study in verses 24 to 26, this is what I leave you with. Enjoy the life God gives you and fear God at the same time. God bless you. Father, we thank you 
for the testimony of Solomon. And you set this man on the earth, you gave him wisdom, and you also said, in addition to wisdom, you will give him wealth and success and power and everything. And he, in return, used that to experiment to say, okay, I have the greatest wealth, the greatest power, and the greatest wisdom. Let me see God's creation the way it is to see whether there is anything in it that provides lasting value. And from his own experience, his own testing of his own life, he found that no one provided lasting value. It is in you and you only that man can find lasting great value. We can only enjoy what we have while it's there. Help us, Lord, to seek you and to find you in everything of our life, what we have, knowledge we have, skills we have, possessions we have, relationships we maintain on earth. Help us, Lord, to to acknowledge you in all of those things so that you might direct our path and we might live a life in God's wisdom. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.